Well, welcome everyone to the uh, Sports Medicine Echo broadcast on ankle pain. My name is Anthony Butler. I run the Sports Medicine Fellowship here in Washington, D.C. at Uniform Church University. I'm very pleased to be here on this snowy day where the federal government's closed. But uh, just like the post office, rain or shine, sleet or snow, and even though the post office is not delivering today, we're going to deliver for you this content on ankle pain and uh, hope that you enjoy it. Without further ado, here's the CME stuff, that all sorts of uh, fun disclaimers to put you to sleep before we start our lecture. This is important, though. If you're going to try to get CME credit for this, these are some uh, uh, information on how to do that, and that uh, you need to make sure you're signed in to do that. But this slide and all my slides are available on DCO, and so you can get that uh, after the lecture and figure out what you need to do. So what are we going to do this morning? Uh, we're going to talk about your mission if you choose to accept. We'll talk through an ankle sprain case in some detail. We'll also talk about victims and culprits, how we use those to approach musculoskeletal care. And we'll talk about evidence-based treatment for ankle sprain quite a bit. We'll do some variations on the theme. We'll have some other cases towards the end that will tell us a little bit more about uh, ankle sprain. And we'll uh, hopefully have some time for some questions and answers. So, <clears throat> moving right along, our goal is to better diagnose, treat, and code for musculoskeletal pain, as always, as we do that. All right, so your mission if you choose to accept it. What is that? Your mission in ankle pain is, quite simply, to understand this is the most incredibly common diagnosis that's out there. It's the number one most common diagnosis in the ER. We see a ton of ankle sprains in the military, certainly in civilian sports medicine practice, too. Your mission in ankle, ankle sprain is similar, actually, to low back pain. You want to determine, is this just a simple ankle sprain, and is it going to respond to the treatment that we'll talk you through in some detail today, or is this something more serious that maybe needs specialty care? Just like low back pain, where we kind of use red flag questions to sort of understand, oh, this might be something more serious than just garden variety low back pain, ankle sprains are similar. We're going to use some rules, we're going to use some techniques to figure out, is this just an ankle sprain, and will my ankle sprain treatment work for this, or do you need to do something more particular for it. One of those things you might want to do is use your x-ray vision, but if your x-ray vision is broken, like mine is most of the time, then you'll need to use the auto ankle rules to determine if you need to do an x-ray or not on the ankles that are sore around you. Ignore the picture for just a second, let's talk about a couple of the rules. Uh, some of the rules are that your patient needs to be able to walk uh, three steps in the uh, immediately after the injury, needs to be able to walk three steps in your exam room, uh, if they can't do either of those, obviously they fail the uh, auto ankle rules. There are some other ways that they can fail, and that's based on tenderness. Obviously, here that we're looking at, if they are tender over the posterior uh, lateral malleolus or the posterior inferior malleolus here, or if, they post, if they're tender over the posterior medial malleolus here, that would be a, a fail. They would need an x-ray there. If they're tender over the navicular here or there, if they're tender over the base of the fifth metatarsal, then that's all things that need to be x-rays. So if they have any of these things right here, then uh, that obviously is a fail. The autoankle rules and they need to have x-rays taken. So <clears throat> there are some provisos and quid pro quos, right? Who let the lawyer in? Well, uh, some of those things are that you can only use the auto ankle rules for acute injuries, for acute ankle injuries. If someone's had this injury, had ankle pain for a while, I usually use the use uh, about uh, one to two weeks as that while, then we shouldn't use the auto ankle rules to determine if we need an x-ray. Uh, those po folks, if they've had sprain pain for more than a couple of weeks, then they probably do need an x-ray. You cannot use the auto ankle rules for kids because they have open growth plates and they'll uh, often be tender in places that, that adults wouldn't be. So pretty much all kids need to have x-rays if they come in with a uh, sprained ankle. All right, moving along here, those are on mission. If you choose to accept it, you choose to accept the auto ankle rules for what they are. Use those to determine if your patient needs an x-ray. And let's talk through the an ankle sprain case. So our first guy is a 38-year-old male with left ankle pain. He was playing tennis yesterday afternoon, and as he was playing tennis, ouch, that looks really sore. This happened to him. The ankle just kind of went, hey, uh, let's watch it one more time and just see if we can make ourselves sick. Oh, good. All right. Well, he has some ankle pain. All right. What else do you know about this guy? He's limping, but he can bear weight. He has a uh, past medical history significant for weak ankles. Gee, no kidding. But no ankle surgeries and no other musculoskeletal surgeries that he has going on there. When you do an exam, you see this ankle swollen, especially lateral. It's got some ecchymosis there. He has these funny shaded areas that are painted all over his ankle, but he's not tender over any of those. He is very tender, antrodistal lateral malleolus, where he has this orange kind of circle painted on his ankle. He's very tender there. 
and uh, you decide you'd like to get some x-rays, uh, but uh, when you're uh, going to get some x-rays, you find out that your, vacation, your tech is on vacation to Ottawa, so that doesn't really work out very well for you. So, diagnosis, what do we have here? Well, uh, if I had to make this diagnosis, I would say this is obviously an ankle sprain. Even more particularly, this is a lateral ankle sprain. Why do I care that's a lateral ankle sprain and not another medial sprain or whatever? I care because of the biomechanics of the lateral ankle. This is really built in to be a buckle point. If you look at the ATFL, this is it right here in yellow, you'll see the ATFL, it's the, one of the weakest ligaments in the body. People wonder, well, how can you tear your ATFL when you sprain your ankle, which is where we most commonly do, because when I roll this ankle over laterally, I should tear the CFL right here, this, this oriented longitudinally like this. But I don't because usually I'm going to tear my ATFL because my foot is going to be down in plantar flexion when I roll over my ankle laterally, and I'll get that right there. So that'll make me tear the ATFL. The ATFL is built in as a buckle point. It's where we're supposed to tear. Where else do we find buckle points? I, my favorite buckle point is when we find those in the hood of our car, right? How many of you have had this happen? True confessions, right? You're going along, you're not going very fast at all, and you just happen to slightly bump into like a light post or the other car in front of you, right? Even though you're not going very fast and you just barely kind of bump that, what happens to your hood of your car? Well, it, it crumples all up and it forms this big mountain. Why does it do that? It does that because it's got a buckle point built into it. That buckle point is designed to uh, bend right there. The hood needs to bend right there because if it doesn't, it'll come right back off those hinges and come to the windshield like a guillotine and chop your head off. So um, they designed this buckle point where those hoods are supposed to bend with the slightest force uh, because that's where they want them to bend and break instead of coming through the hood and getting you. So uh, so uh, that's a buckle point. The ATFL is our buckle point. And if, if uh, we break there, then we're happy because that's where kind of God designed us to break on the ATFL on the lateral ankle. Why do we care about that? Because medial sprains can be a little bit more scary than that. So we'll talk about medial lateral ankle sprains a little bit more. If we're looking at what else this could be, certainly it could be an ankle fracture, right? But uh, it's failed. it didn't fail the lateral ankle rule, so it's probably not an ankle fracture. It could be a foot injury. Remember, don't get so caught up in looking at the ankle up here that you forget there's all these bones down here, and people can think they have an ankle sprain when what they have actually is a foot injury down in this region. Make sure you distinguish that. The ankle is there, foot is there. Never confuse the two. All right, great. Medial ankle sprains can be. Now look at this here. So if you're an engineer and you want to design something for stability, do you want to design something with like a lot of thin little wispy ligaments here, like in the lateral foot here? Or are we looking to design something that's big, thick, broad, medial ankle right here with this huge deltoid ligament? Obviously this is a lot more stable, a lot more difficult to tear. So medial ankle sprains, they can happen, but they're often much higher energy injuries and we have to pay attention to those. I have to just remember, mm, I've got to make sure this is just a sprain because really they should tear on the lateral side. That's their buckle point. Medial ankle sprains are just a little bit different. There's some other type of sprains that we can get a high ankle sprain, a, a syndesmotic sprain, proteal ligament injuries. Oh my goodness, look at that. We have victims and culprits. So let's talk about victims and culprits for just a second. Whenever you're dealing with an injury, and we decided this is a lateral ankle sprain, why do you need to worry about victims and culprits? Usually our victims is what's caused the injury, right? What the, so we're looking for the victim is the injured substance. So for us here, the victim is obviously going to be the ATFL. That's what's injured. And the culprit is usually what has caused that injury to happen. So if our victim then is the ATFL, that's what's been injured, we're looking for the culprit of how we, what's caused this to happen because if we don't treat the culprit, the victim is going to get injured over and over again. Now, it's important to understand that the, the culprit's probably not the basketball court. In fact, oh my goodness, the culprit could be the basket in this way, I suppose, in this sort of ankle sprain right here. But uh, the culprits in acute injuries are often not very relevant, right? It's not often that you need your foot caught in a basketball standard and sprain your ankle. It's not really often that you're going to be going along and just kind of roll your foot over in tennis, at least I hope not. The culprits that we're most interested in are these culprits for re-injury. Once you've had your first ankle sprain, then you're at risk for subsequent ankle sprains, at a very high risk for subsequent ankle sprains. And my job as a sports medicine doctor is to take care of those culprits for re-injury so you don't just continue to re-injure your ankle over and over again. So, how are we going to do that? First of all, we're going to address how we going to get away with addressing loss of motion, loss of strength, and loss of balance. These are the three things that you lose when you sprain your ankle. We've got to address a rehab program to get all those things back. A question for you out there in the audience, that question is, 
after a grade 1 to 2 ankle sprain, how long should you wear an ankle brace for? Should you wear it one, not at all? Should you wear it six to eight days, six to eight weeks, six to eight months, or should you just wear it indefinitely for the rest of your life? There's an answer to that, and we'll, uh, we'll get to that, but I'm uh, interested in your answers to that question. How long, on a grade one to two ankle sprain, would you tell your patient to wear their ankle brace for? All right, <clears throat> let's get back to our victims and culprits here. So if you look at these victims and culprits, how do you treat an ankle sprain? And understanding the victims and culprits really helps us better understand how we should treat things. So what do we use for treatment? A lot of the times, I rarely see an ankle sprain that has not been treated with this. So people do rice, the rest, ice compression, they use NSAIDs, they might even use a brace or a wrap or something like that to try to help that. These are all fine treatments right here, but it's important to understand that these are all victim-based treatments. These all are designed to kind of bandage up and make the victim feel better. But now, really, if we're going to be successful as a sports medicine doctor, we not only have to treat the victim, but we also need to address the culprits. So how do we do that? Well, we want to make sure that we address these culprits for re-injury. So after we've done our acute treatment, what else is there to do? For loss of motion, what things could we do? Well, we could do some ABC exercises where we draw the alphabet on the floor with our toes. For loss of strength, we can do some towel drag exercises. For loss of proprioception, and this is a very important key here, we want to make sure that we do some balance drills to get our balance back. On DCO is, is uh, this handout in a Word document format. You can put your name and your practice right up here and look really smart if you want. So this is the rehabilitation for ankle sprain, and it goes through this for your patients, how to do these range of motion exercises with their alphabet, how to drag the towel so they can get their strength back. On the back is their proprioceptive exercise. This is so important that they drill proprioception, right? Because what usually happens after, this is the part where people fall down all the time, uh, no pun intended. This is the part where people don't do their rehab properly. They do the other things, but they forget that they've got to get that sense of balance and their proprioception back. What's the most common thing that happens when people come back and see me for a current ankle spray? They say, oh, Dr. Butler, I was doing fine. I was doing great, and my ankle is feeling good. And I was running down the football field, and I suddenly, I stepped in a hole, right? I stepped in a hole, and my ankle tipped over, and now it's re-hurt again. Now, if I go out to that football field, and if I look at where they were when this happened, is there a hole there? No, there's no hole there. There's not a hole there. If there were as many holes as my patients say there are in the world, the whole world would look like a golf ball with dimples all over the place. There's not that many holes in the world. They didn't step in a hole. What happened to them was they didn't get this proprioception back. They didn't get back their sense of balance and position and where they are in space in the world. And because they didn't get that back, <clears throat> then when they were going down the football field, they kind of lost track of where that ankle was in space. They were paying attention to the ball, they were paying attention to the crowd, maybe there was a cute cheerleader on the end, I don't know what happened, but they lost track of their ankle and they tipped that ankle over and that's where their loss of proprioception. So it's very important that they get this proprioception back so that they can uh, not re-sprain their ankle again. How do we do that? Well, we're going to train them by standing on uh, one leg to help our balance. What we do to uh, help our balance is that uh, we're going to stand on one leg. Everyone has to brush their teeth, so they might as well do it then. They stand on one leg, and they practice standing there, and then when they can brush their teeth, stand on one leg, then they want to go ahead and brush their teeth, stand on one leg while they close their eyes. Then after that, they can progress to doing that while they are standing on kind of a soft surface, maybe a pillow, not their spouse's nice pillow, that's not a nice thing to do, but some other pillow they can stand on that makes it a soft surface. And there's all that's spelled out very well here in this handout. that will teach you and your patients how to get through this uh, important addressing these three factors, this loss of motion, loss of strength, and loss of proprioception that happens with every ankle injury. Some thinking points for you as we go forward are to make sure that we understand that the medial ankle sprains, they can happen, but we want to be skeptical and cautious. Understand that that, uh, that does happen. And when there is just a true medial ankle sprain, we treat it just the same. We treat it with the exact same three exercises and some rice up front. Now, if it's a sprain but your patient can't walk, obviously you, if the patient can't walk, then you've got to have an x-ray that shows no fractures to tell you that this is, because that violates auto ankle rules, right? So if, they, if your patient can't walk and you, but it's still a sprain, what do you do next? Well, the most important thing you can do for them is get them a brace. I can't count the number of times that you get somebody a brace with an ankle sprain. They can't walk. You put this brace on them and they say, doctor, doctor, I can walk. Braces really help a lot with pain, a lot with stability. And, uh, and uh, they can, uh, they can uh, really help uh, people be able to walk better. And uh, so use those to help people who otherwise wouldn't be able to walk. 
If they need crutches, you can get them those as well. Try to get them off those crutches as fast as they can, unless it's a third degree ankle sprain. We might have a chance to talk about that a little bit more at the end. So braces and crutches can be helpful things for us. What brace should I use? That really depends on who your patient is. Here we have two different kinds of braces that are here. There's the ankle stirrup brace right here. It's kind of the air cast gel brace that's right here. And then there's also the uh, more traditional uh, lace-up ASO with Velcro here that we have. Which one do I use? Depends on my patient. <clears throat> Young people will not wear this uh, brace right here. This is not svelte. It does not fit in their shoe. It provides maximum protection probably, but LeBron and Kobe do not wear this, right? So they are not going to wear this brace. They will wear this brace here. This is svelte. It fits in their shoe. LeBron and Kobe both wear these, and so they will too. So if it's a young person, pick this brace right here. Old people love this brace. This brace uh, requires, this ASO down here requires a lot of dexterity to get on. Velcro's kind of tough, lots of laces. People, old people don't tend to like this one very well. They love this one because it's easy to put on. It goes into the shoes that they want to wear just fine, provides maximum stability, and for them, braces are more a badge of honor anyway. They don't care who knows that they have an ankle brace on. They want that maximum stability. Older people like this one, younger people like this one. If we're going to decrease our injury rate, we want to use these braces for six to eight months um, then, uh, after our injury. That's a long time, but that's what the studies say. It really takes that long for the collagen to reorient and heal. And for us, we can show that we can prevent a second ankle sprain up to six to eight months later by wearing these braces. You don't have to wear them all the time, but certainly when you're engaged in athletic type activity. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So, when should my patient come back if they're not better? We want them to come back if they're not better in six weeks. So that's kind of a key time for us. Welcome to the Gramsies. Since you've heard about the Grammys, but uh, we're going to talk about the Gramsies here now, which is great research that might just be practice changing. Uh, what do we have for research on ankle sprain? We have a great ankle sprain review. How can we minimize recurrent ankle sprains? Love this one from our very own in the Journal of Family Practice. It's a couple years old now, but still very, very relevant. The first thing that we can do as family medicine doctors to prevent recurrent ankle sprains is get our patients to wear ankle braces. Strength of evidence A, okay? We, these are lace-up, these semi-rigid braces that prevent primary and secondary injury. Certainly they have a bigger effect in secondary prevention, but it's still significant in primary prevention for people who are at high risk. So if you're taking care of a basketball team, deployed troops, playing basketball for the first time in some time, I really consider these as primary prevention, but certainly for secondary prevention. Anyone who's had an ankle sprain should be in one of these braces for at least six to eight months afterwards. The number needed to treat is combined, the number needed to treat combined for primary and secondary is 22. I mean, you've got to give 22 braces to prevent one sprain, but if you're just looking for secondary strain, se injury, that number dropped precipitously down to about seven or eight. You only have to give out about seven or eight braces to prevent one recurrent sprain. So they're very cost effective, uh, very worth it. The second thing that we could do, other than wearing balance braces, is do balance training. Uh, very effective, again, for primary prevention. Number needed to treat 22. 22 for primary prevention with a simple exercise. My goodness. We should be doing those in a lot of our athletes then. They're also very effective, again, number needed to treat of 9 for secondary prevention. Just as good as a brace is doing your balance training. Imagine if you can get your athletes to do both, how good that would be. So wear your ankle braces, do your balance training, and away we go. I love this next study, too, because my patients always tell me this, but doctor, I can't jump in my brace. This gets in my way. And I love to print this study out and hand it to them, then, because this is important. This looks at the effect of prophylactic ankle bracing on military cadets. So this is up at West Point, right? We've got 37 healthy military cadets that are up here. They did the obstacle course and functional measures with and without braces. So we strapped on these braces on these perfectly healthy young men and young women and told them to go out and uh, do the obstacle course and uh, the function and the two minute run two mile run and all those things with and without these braces so with the braces on we found that there was small difference in their range of motion when they were braced than when they were not meaning their ankles didn't move as far but other than that there's really no differences in agility no differences in run time and no difference in other performance measures because they were wearing these ankle braces so if your patients come into you and say doctor I can't jump because of these braces or I'm clumsy in these braces say suck it up and wear your brace it's not your braces fault it's yours if you can't jump it's your fault if you can't run fast it's your fault because it's not your brace slowing you down so don't let your patients get away with telling you they can't wear their braces because they can. 
All right, so then treatments for victims and culprits for lateral ankle sprain, or really any ankle sprain that we have. Again, we're going to take care of our things with our, our initial victim with these victim-based treatments here. We always do those, so we'll do those for sure. But the important thing is to make sure that we're taking care of these culprits for re-injury. We want to make sure that we address the loss of motion, loss of strength, and loss of proprioception with ABC exercises, towel drags, and balance drills so we get people back. We're going to do strength and balance, wear the brace, and make sure they come back after six weeks if they're not better so that we can take good care of them. All right, so there's our first case, and uh, we're cruising along. Let's talk about then some variations on the theme after we've gone through this first case. What else might come into your office? Ah, case number two. 25-year-old Marine thrown from a mechanical bull who now complains of lateral ankle pain. He could walk then. He can walk now in your office, but it hurts to walk. So he's come to see you and hope that you can make him better. On exam, he has no tenderness palpation of the medial malleolus. Whew, that's good. We hate medial ankle sprains. Remember, those are unnatural and difficult. He has no tenderness palpation on the base of the fifth. The navicular, Liz Frank, and uh, the are all fine. He has a negative tib-fib squeeze, but he is tender to palpation of the posterior and inferior lateral malleolus. So, that violates the auto ankle rules, right? So, does he need an x-ray? Absolutely, he does. Let's have a look at that x-ray and see what it says. Look at this x-ray. You can see this ossicle that he has down here. He's got an old fracture. This is an old avulsion fracture. This, this is pretty old if you look at this ossified down there. So what does that do? What do you do with this? Well, looking at treatment, <coughs> we have here that uh, there's a lateral malleolus avulsion fracture, otherwise known as an ankle sprain, which is just an x-ray, <coughs> excuse me, an ankle sprain with x-ray findings. And so what do we do with that? We're going to treat this just as we would with an ankle sprain. We're going to be even extra heavy on our brace sauce, since this ossicle looks old. This is not this guy's first trip to the rodeo. This is not his first ankle sprain. So we want to make sure that we are uh, taking good care of his ankle with all the same things that we did before. And when should he come back and see you if this is still painful for him? Well, of course, we tell the same thing, right? We're going to come back and see us in six weeks. So six weeks later, <coughs> he does come back. So now he's complaining of status post ankle sprain seven weeks ago. He still complains of pain in his lateral ankle. And he says this occasionally swells up and hurts him still with activities. And he says, doctor, doctor, you didn't fix me before, but you must fix me now. How can you help me now? So now what do you do? What do you do with this guy? What do you do with the person who comes back in with persistent ankle sprain or the ankle sprain that won't get better? How do you take care of that? Let's have a look at that. With the ankle sprain that won't get better, you want to go through a history checklist. So on the history checklist, what do we have? We want to make sure they've been compliant with treatment uh, for sure. Have they done their rehab? Did they wear their brace as they were instructed to do? If they were placed in the cast, how did that go for them? What did they have done and did they do their treatment as they were instructed? Were they ever on crutches? Have they done their rehab? Was he prescribed triple therapy rehab and did he do it? What did he actually do? Can he demonstrate it for you? Patients who have actually done ankles rehab for six weeks and done it religiously and well, they will be able to demonstrate that for you in your office. You, they won't have to say, oh, I don't have my sheet or something like that. They'll actually be able to show you the exercises just fine. If you've done something that almost every day for six weeks, you'll have it down. So you want to look at this uh, treatment of compliance with rehab. Ask him about instability. Is his complaint of instability? Does his ankle just tip over for no reason? Or is this mostly just pain? Again, ask him about his rehab. Have you done his rehab? Is this a recurrent injury for him? Has he sprained his ankle before? And no, really, did he do triple therapy rehab? So before you call your SGH that I'm prescribing triple therapy, amoxicillin, pilosec, and biaxin for ankle sprains, remember our triple therapy rehab is simply this, right? It's ABCs to address our range of motion that deficit that we get with ankle sprains. It's talgy exercise to address the strength deficit. And it's proprioceptive exercise. We must have all three triple therapy rehab in order to make sure we have done adequate ankle rehab and uh, can satisfy the thing. So after we've done our history checklist, next would be our exam checklist. We want to pinpoint our pain. We want to think about our anatomy. We want to do a very careful exam to try to go through and make sure that we identify really where his pain is coming from. Put him through a range of motion. What motions hurt him now? What specific things hurt? And we want to determine if his ligaments are intact. So this is the first time that you'll hear me talk about this, the anterior drawer and Taylor tilt. Anterior drawer and Taylor tilt are not very good tests for acute ankle sprain. 
they really hurt. So unless you don't like your patient, please don't do these on an acute ankle sprain. But certainly we need to be doing them when people come in for an ankle sprain that won't get better uh, because we need to find out if the ligaments are intact. So an anterior drawer test, looking at the ATFL, a tailored tilt test, primary looks at this calcaneal fibula ligament, see if those are intact. That will help us know about our ankle sprains there. How's the patient's strength? Does he have strong muscles now or his muscles still weak? Testing that out manually is going to be important. Very important to test his proprioception. How do we do that? Simple. Stand him up, put him on his good foot. Stand him just on his one foot, have him put his hands on his hips, and close his eyes. He should be able to stand there pretty well. He might do a little wobble, but he's not going to wobble much. Now stand him on his bad foot, on his injured foot. Have him keep his eyes open and put his hands on his hips. If he starts to wobble already, then if you can have him close his eyes, but get up close to him because you have to catch him because he's going to fall over. So stand on one foot with your eyes closed. If you've done proprioceptive training, you'll be able to do that just fine, even on an injured ankle six weeks later. But if you can't do that, then your proprioception is not good and he probably hasn't done his proprioceptive rehab. Does he need x-rays? Yes, obviously anybody who has had an ankle injury weeks ago, the auto ankle rules no longer apply. Anyone who has persistent ankle pain, they need to have x-rays at this point. Whether he's had x-rays before or he has, hasn't, he needs them today. So let's go ahead and get those x-rays and see what they look. So here he is, seven-week ankle sprains. Let's run him through his handout then in his checklist. When you ask him about therapy and rehab, he says, well, I, yeah, I have a handout at home and I've done some of those exercises sometimes. But he can't demonstrate them for you in the room, which means what? He, he maybe did them once or twice, right? So he hasn't really done his rehab. What about his pinpoint pain? He is sore over the ATFL. That's where he's the most sore, is right over that. His range of motion, he has pain at all extremes of the range of motion, not one dominant motion, but all the extremes of motion hurt him. His ligaments are intact. His strength is fine. His proprioception is really quite poor. He puts his hands on his hips, and even before he can close his eyes, he's very wobbly on that injured ankle. So x-rays, yes, he does need some x-rays, and here they are. Uh, you look around and you say, well, I don't really see anything. He's obviously, he's hurt his ankle before. He's got this kind of squitch in there. But look, even his ossicle looks like he's healed up here. This, these x-rays are absolutely fine. I don't see any problem with this. No, no, nothing on his x-ray here. So now we get to the two key questions of recurrent ankle pain or persistent ankle pain, I should say. These two key questions for people whose ankle sprains have not gotten better. What are they? First question is, is the history, physical, and x-rays, are they consistent with an ankle sprain? Is this, did it sound like an ankle sprain before? Does it still sound like an ankle sprain now? If yes, then we proceed to question two. If no, well, then we usually need something else. We need advanced imaging because it's not an ankle sprain. We need to figure out what it is. Usually that means we need an MRI. And we need to start the treatment for the suspected diagnosis, which usually means we need to ask question number two anyway. But let's just go ahead and now proceed on then to question number two. What is question number two? So after we've asked this first one, this question number two is, has the patient done adequate triple therapy rehab? Again, that question over and over again. Our patients should be sick of that by the time we're done with this visit. If yes, so if the answer to our first question is yes, they, uh, we still think this is an ankle sprain, and yes, the patient is in adequate triple therapy rehab, then we need an MRI on this, right? We need to figure out, well, it's, it's an ankle sprain. It should have gotten better. They've done the right things. Then we need to get an MRI and figure out what this is. We want to consider bracing for instability. We need to keep him in that brace, make sure he's done that. And we may need to refer this to a sports medicine physician, or maybe an orthopedic surgeon, to say, how come this ankle sprain is not getting better after we've ordered that MRI? If the patient has, if the history is still consistent with ankle, sp with ankle sprain, but the patient has not done their triple therapy rehab for six weeks, then please don't order an MRI. The person just needs to have the fear of God speech, and they need to get their rehab done. So if they need a physical therapist to help them with that rehab, get them to a physical therapist. If they need some sort of command-directed instruction to do their rehab, then get them the rehab done. But they've got to do six weeks of adequate triple therapy rehab. Otherwise, we can't help them. We can't help them unless they help them. So we're going to send them out for six more weeks and evaluate them when they come back in six weeks. Now, how do we apply these two key questions in our case? Our 27-year-old Brahma bull rider who's back in our office uh, complaining of pain after six weeks. So 
is his history, physical exam and x-rays, are they consistent with ankle sprain? Yes, they are, right? And yes, they were. So he's, uh, his history was consistent with an ankle sprain. His x-rays were, and his ankle and, and physical still today is consistent with an ankle sprain. So it, it, it does look like an ankle sprain. And has he done adequate triple therapy rehab? Absolutely not. So what do we want? We want six weeks of good triple therapy rehab. Might get him to a PT to help him, and he's got to, we're going to reevaluate him in six weeks. And if at that, that point, if after 12 weeks he's still not, uh, still not back to good, we might want to consider an MRI persistent symptoms, but uh, really making sure he's done his rehab is really important. So that's how we address that thing there, and we want to make sure we do that. Now, if we find out, we've asked this key question, are the history, physical, and x-rays consistent with ankle sprain? And when we come back for a reval, we say, you know, no, they're not. I mean, maybe it was at the start, or maybe it wasn't at the start, but certainly today, this doesn't sound like an ankle sprain. This sounds like something else. Well, what else could it be? What, well, we think about when we get the MRI. This could be inadequate rehab, right? The number one diagnosis that causes people ankle pain is they've had a sprain and they've done inadequate rehab. So that's always the number one diagnosis. But there are some other things it could be. It could be a missed fracture. Uh, these are all different fractures that it could be. It could be an osteochondral defect, right? A tailor dome, a piece of that cartilage off the tailor dome has come off and now that's causing them some pain. It could be tendon issues. Uh, it could be some sort of weirdo sprain, like a medial sprain, a high ankle sprain, a bifurcate ligament sprain. There's all sorts of weird sprains can be in the foot and ankle, but it could be. Those are some things that can certainly cause you pain. Other things that patients complain of is instead of complaining of pain, they should say, well, doc, my ankle doesn't actually feel bad, but it's unstable. It just keeps flipping over on me. So if they have primarily instability complaints, what's, what does that what could that be? Again, inadequate proprioceptive rehab is the number one diagnosis here. The most common thing that we have is inability or an, unable to do the proprioceptive rehab they should have done. But it could also be a ligament rupture. We've talked about those. And if they don't have ligaments, that can lead to instability. It could be a tarsal coalition where the bones in the midfoot have actually uh, formed funny and have kind of coalesced together. Those people are often locked in kind of an eversion. They're up in a very pez cavus stance, and that predisposes them to tip that ankle over, over and over again. So look for that if you have somebody who's complaining of primary ankle instability. All right, so that was case number two. Let's talk about case three, and then we'll have some time to uh, ask some, answer some questions that we have here. Case number three. High school basketball player twists from an ankle, uh, an ankle landing from a rebound, and he can't walk on it. Now he's in the emergency room. Now this is not a high school basketball player, and I hope his ankle doesn't look like that. Maybe it does, but uh, there we go. So what do we do? If he can't walk on it in the ER, then what do we need? Ah, uh, well, we need an ankle X-ray for sure because he's violated the Ottawa ankle rules, and we can't have that. So if we look at this X-ray, which of course we need. We look at ooh, well. That doesn't look so good, right? So we've got a sprain here. This is not an avulsion fracture, right? This is on the medial side. Medial, avulsion fracture would be less than that. He's broken off the whole medial malleolus there. And then look at this space here. Look at this. Uh, this is what we call a syndesmotic gap. So yeah, there's no overlap here. The fibula and, and tibia have come apart, and his syndesmosis is ruptured here. This is a very significant injury. He's had force that's broken this, and this force has traveled through here, ruptured the syndesmotic membrane here, syndesmotic ligament and it's probably come out somewhere up there. So this is a big, bad ankle fracture. So what do we do with this? <clears throat> well, obviously this is not an ankle sprain, so uh, this is part of our mission, right? Our mission, if we choose to accept it, we have, uh, we've done our diligence. We found out this is not an ankle sprain. We should not prescribe this person triple therapy rehab. We should not say, you know, suck it up and, and walk and let's get you a brace. We want to verify that they are neurovascularly intact distally. Look at their toes, make sure they can feel things, make sure they've got good pulses. And we need to send these people to ortho. Now is best, right? <laughs> it would be best to send them right now. If that's not possible, if they're not going to be seen by ortho for a while, then if they're neurovascularly intact, then we need a bulky Jones dressing. And uh, you can look those up and see how to make those, but uh, it involves some cotton and some splint. They're actually a lot of fun. Make sure they don't walk on this, not that they would try. But uh, bulky Jones dressing and non weight brain tear ortho can see them and put this ankle right is going to be important to do. Again, our job, our mission, if we've chosen to accept it, is to determine what is an ankle sprain and what isn't. This clearly is not, so uh, we just need to get it on to somebody who can help with that. Well, we're just about ready for questions. You've endured enough of my talking for a bit, uh, but uh, before we get there, let's just review some of the things we've talked about. Remember, when we're treating ankle sprains, we're going to use our victim-based treatments of rice, NSAIDs, and bracing to address the ATFL, make sure that it feels all comfy, cozy. But that's not enough. We've got to make sure we look at the culprits for re-injury. They've lost motion. They must do ABC exercises. They've lost strength. 
they must do child drag exercises. They've lost proprioception, that sense of balance, so they need to do some balance drills. If we do those things, strength and balance, if we use our brace judiciously, again, that's six to eight weeks, excuse me, six to eight months following the primary ankle sprain, with athletic activities, we can prevent recurrent sprains, especially if they're doing the balance drills, and everybody will be happy with that. If they're still having pain, have them come back after six weeks. When they do come back, remember our two key questions are, is the history, physical, and x-rays, were they then and are they still now consistent with ankle sprain? Yes or no? And then, has the patient really done adequate triple therapy rehab? Yes or no? Those two questions are going to really give us what we need to be able to answer the question, do they need an MRI now? They certainly need an x-ray now, but do they need an MRI now? And do we refer them now? Do they just need more rehab? Those are the keys we need to be able to understand uh, how we should treat their ankle sprains with. So, with that being said, I think we are ready now for our mission quite possible questions. Uh, this is the Washington, D.C. stretch limo. Can't drive today because it's in the snow. Preston, Idaho stretch limo, which is where I grew up. So if you think I've stretched the truth at all, I'd love to know. So uh, thanks to our models who modeled their ankles for us in this, uh, in this presentation. But if there are any questions out there, I'd be happy to take those and talk through them now. Okay, I found some question here. So... Uh, there's a question from, uh, is there value in a neoprene brace? That's a really good question, and uh, I'll tell you that I don't think neoprene braces are without value. They probably do some things. Those ankle sleeves is what I call them. They're just kind of like knee sleeves, those ankle sleeves. They probably keep that ankle a little bit warm. Uh, that will help people with their pain. And anything that you place on the ankle will help a little bit with proprioception. It's kind of like athletic tape for ankle sprain, right? So uh, athletic tape, we know that that loses, that white ankle tape that they use, it loses pretty much all of its tensile strength in about three to five minutes of uh, participation. So after that, there's really no structural support that's being offered by that ankle, ankle tape. Why is it still helpful for ankle sprain? Because it's helping with proprioception. It's kind of helping your skin be more of a proprioceptive organ because as you move and that tape does tug on your skin, it reminds you to put your ankle where it's supposed to go. So it's probably giving proprioceptive feedback. So I think, uh, is there value in a neoprene brace? Yes, there is, but it's probably not the best value. The best value is one of those uh, uh, lace-up ankle braces with the straps that kind of makes an X over the top with the Velcro on there like that. That's what you're really looking for. Those have been the ones that have been studied and are most valuable for uh, your patients to have. And they're not expensive. And again, you want to wear those ankle braces all the time. Pretty much, well, you don't have to wear them when you're in bed or when you're in the shower, but whenever you're up and around on that ankle, you want to wear, those, wear that brace until you can stand on that ankle uh, kind of on one leg and brush your teeth uh, and think about closing your eyes a little bit. Once your proprioception starts to come back online, then you can probably go just to uh, wear that ankle brace uh, with athletic activities for the next six to eight months. But until you really get some proprioception starting to come back in that ankle when you can start to stand on it on one foot and not just instantly fall down, you want to wear that ankle brace all the time to protect that uh, ligament that's healing and also give yourself some increased proprioceptive feedback. There's a question for us. When do you think it's safe to have a patient do home exercise versus a physical therapist? I think that pretty much with anybody with an ankle sprain, if they you know don't have some sort of contraindication, so um, if they can understand written English, these exercises are pretty easy to do. And as I've shown you, you don't really need any sort of fancy equipment. Everybody ha pretty much has the has a floor. They have the alphabet. They have towels they can drag along the floor. So if you can get them a brace, then you don't really need a physical therapist for most ankle sprains um, for the first time rehab. Certainly, if I have the person come back in six weeks and they're still having pain and I think they haven't done their rehab properly, then absolutely, I'm going to send them to physical therapy for some supervised rehab. Or if the per patient's a little bit older, if there's somebody that I don't trust, if they're, if they're a high-level athlete, that uh, it's going to get better if they can do their rehab uh, and advance it more quickly. But uh, for, most, uh, for most garden variety ankle sprains and most folks, I think home rehab is fine um, unless they've uh, proven that they just won't or can't do it. So I think that's, um, that's an important, uh, important thing to do. Let's see, some things here from Interlick. Aside from walking a patient through the exercises, is there anything that PT does for sprains that a patient can't do at home? Uh, yeah, there are some things that they do it, that a patient can't do at home. 
um, they will wrap the ankle, and they're certainly, uh, especially for a more severe ankle sprain, and we'll talk about those in just a second, we'll talk about a third degree ankle sprain, but for a more severe ankle sprain, there is some benefit to a more aggressive anti-inflammatory treatment, and the PTs with their wraps that they can do, they use kind of those felt donuts, they do the wraps, the iontophoresis, the aggressive icing, things like that. There are some things that they can do that will take the swelling out of an ankle, and uh, help that ankle feel better. Now, unless it's a really bad ankle sprain, and unless and that, that probably only gets the patient, you know, back to work maybe a day earlier. So um, uh, you have to use your best judgment on, on if it's really worth flooding your PT uh, with a, a simple ankle sprain or not. So, but there are a few things that they can do that maybe uh, a patient could not do at home. Let's talk just for a second about third degree ankle sprains since a lot of uh, what you're talking about, of do, do I send it to a PT or do I not, for me it really comes down to grading an ankle sprain. So uh, how do we distinguish a first and a second degree ankle sprain? Well, basically we stick our finger in the wind and we make it up, right? My first degree ankle sprain might be different than your second degree, might be different, the same as your first degree, who knows. But third degree ankle sprains are really where we need to make the distinction. And a third degree ankle sprain is only diagnosed retrospectively. So third degree ankle sprain means that a patient still cannot bear weight on that ankle in a brace after 72 hours. So there are sprains that are that severe. And if you have somebody like that, so that would be a patient and how that would work is they'd come see you, right? They'd come see me. I'd look at them and say, ooh, that's a big swollen ankle. That really looks bad. And they wouldn't be able to walk in my office or in the emergency room. And so I'd put an ankle brace on them and say, there, now walk. And they won't walk. And I'll say, ah, well, this could be a third degree ankle sprain. I won't know for 72 hours, but I'm going to give them crutches. I'm going to have them not weight bear on that. I'm going to, like, also, I'm going to go more towards that ankle stirrup brace that we showed you, the kind of the air cast brace. I'm going to put them in that one because I want even more stability than a lace up brace will offer. I'll put them in that ankle stirrup and I'll say, don't walk. I don't want you to walk. I want you to just be on crutches for 72 hours and then come back and see me. Now, at the end of those 72 hours, they come back and I can put them in a lace-up brace and they can walk. And that was not a third degree ankle sprain. It was just a kind of a severe second degree ankle sprain. And now they can just go right on with their functional rehab and try to get better. But when they come back in 72 hours, or if they come see me for the first time, it's been 72 hours, and they still can't walk on that ankle, then that by definition, an ankle sprain that despite you know, good good treatment, x-rays negative, uh, they still can't walk after 72 hours on that. That's a third degree ankle sprain. And we know now that third degree ankle sprains respond better if we treat those with non-weight bearing status, mean on crutches, don't try to walk on it for a week. Just let it heal. So we're going to use that ankle stirrup, that air cast ankle stirrup. We could use a short leg walker or a cam walker if we wanted to, but that ankle stirrup is fine. Where that ankle stirrup put them on crutches, have them don't walk on that for a week, and then come back. I'll probably give them a lace-up brace at that point because it gets a little bit better support than that. And then I'll start them walking on the crutches, starting progressive weight bearing on those crutches, putting their toe down, we been doing 25% body weight, then 50, then 75 after a week. But for one week, they're not weight bearing. So that's a little bit different with the third degree ankle sprains we want to make sure that we pay attention to. All right, a couple more questions here. Uh, question about does ankle taping work to prevent ankle sprains? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, it doesn't look like it works very well to prevent uh, for primary prevention, meaning that like we talked about, because uh, it probably is just providing proprioceptive feedback after about uh, five minutes of activity, ankle taping by itself probably doesn't work to prevent primary prevention of ankle sprains. Now, for secondary prevention, it still does work. Um, so if you've had an ankle sprain, you, sh you could tape your ankle and get some benefit from that um, because of the proprioceptive, increased proprioceptive feedback, and that would be helpful. Now, but how do we approach this uh, with our high school athletes and with our college athletes? I'll tell you, in high-risk sports, we still use ankle taping quite a bit. And probably the way we use it is that we will use it with people who are high risk. If we're looking just for primary prevention, I mean, they haven't sprained their ankle before, we're going to have them certainly doing balance drills in practice and those proprioceptive drills. But we're also going to be able to probably tape their ankle before practice and games and just use tape. If they've had an ankle sprain and then we're trying to prevent a secondary injury and they're secondary prevention, then we're going to tape their ankle, and I'm also going to put a brace on top of that. A brace is better. Why? 
because that ankle uh, tape is going to loosen up after a while, but the brace will loosen up too, but I can retighten that. And I tell my athletes they've got to do that. So after warm-ups, they've got to retighten that brace. After their first couple of real hard reps, they've got to reach down and retighten that brace. They don't have to run under the laces, but they do have to undo those Velcro straps and haul on those and tighten those back up. I can retighten that brace so I actually provide stability to my ankle and protect physically that healing ligament rather than just uh, having to do that, uh, do, do it with just the ankle tape that I know I can't really tighten that ankle tape during practice. But that's sort of what we do. We use ankle tape for primary prevention if we're not really trying very hard along with our um, ankle balance exercises. But if we're going to really try to prevent a secondary sprain, we're going to tape and then probably put the brace on top of it. I don't think we need to do that for our military folks. Probably most of those folks would just fine with the secondary prevention with our, with our, uh, with our lace-up brace, but our athletes, they feel better if they have tape on it. It gives our athletic trainers something to do. How about the newer studies that are steering us away from NSAIDs acutely? What do you do? Hey, really good question there. Um, I think that those studies uh, are interesting. They um, suggest that NSAIDs affect the remodeling of type 1 collagen and that certainly an ankle sprain or ankle ligaments that have healed in the presence of NSAIDs don't heal with the same architectural pattern as uh, as ankle sprains that uh, have healed without uh, without NSAIDs in there. My take on it is this. If I have an athlete who uh, is a high-level performer, so he might be a special ops guy or somebody who really, really is using his ankle and really needs to do that, um, then I'll try to obey the studies. You know, we have really good studies from uh, the Australian military that shows that people who are treated acutely with ankle, uh, with NSAIDs on ankle sprain, that their long-term functional outcomes are not as good on that ankle. And so I might say, well, you know, let's try to avoid the NSAIDs on him or minimize my use of NSAIDs in this person. I'll use Tylenol instead. I'll use ice instead. I'll use compression instead. And uh, because, you know, that the NSAIDs might actually cause them to have decreased proprioception later, increased re-injury is what it looks like in these Australian studies is happening to these folks who were treated with pretty heavy doses of NSAIDs with, for the initial ankle sprain. So I'll do that in somebody who I think is pretty high demand, high speed on their ankle. For just your average everyday person, I don't tend to do that. I tend to emphasize the rehab, one, because they just tend to take the NSAIDs anyway. Um, I don't tend to prescribe them. Usually by the time they get to me, they've taken them already, so the cat's kind of out of the bag. I say, we don't really need to take them. They're not going to help the ankle heal. I try to steer them away from them and uh, and uh, get them back. Again, they do probably get back to work a day faster or back to weight bearing a, a day faster with an NSAID on board. But it, again, it does come at a cost, the newer studies say, of this uh, decreased function long term. It's a very good question. So uh, more to follow, I think, on that as we get better and more studies on that. But certainly is a cause for concern that could we be damaging their long term function by uh, prescribing an NSAID acutely. A, a very good thought to think about that. Do I treat smokers any differently? <laughs> Why are you trying to get me ar arrested by the uh, Equal Opportunity Police here? I, I do, actually. I treat them differently uh, just because um, I think that uh, I think they're going to heal slower. Um, for bony fracture healing, they certainly do heal slower, especially in the distal periphery. So, you know, if I have somebody with a toe fracture, say they've broken their little toe, I'm going to tell that person that that little toe is going to hurt them for three to six months. There's not anything I can do about it. If they're a smoker, I'm going to tell them it's going to hurt for six to 12 months. There's not anything I can do about it. They could stop smoking. Maybe that'll help. Um, but but I, will, uh, I will tell them it's going to take longer. Certainly the same is true for ankle sprain. For just about any musculoskeletal injury, any tort, sort of musculoskeletal injury, it's a great segue to your, you know, if you've ever thought about stopping smoking, this would be a good time because you're just not going to heal very well with smoke on board. It just affects your microvasculature. We can't, we can't really get the building blocks that we need to the right spot and uh, you are not going to heal as well if you're smoking. So uh, I will tell people that their course is going to be a little bit more protracted. We they can expect a little bit longer pain uh, and more pain. And uh, I do use it as a way to talk about smoking cessation. I've had quite a few patients take me up on it. Uh, and this is, this is uh, the final straw that the kid from over the edge to be willing to try some things and work with me on ankle, uh, on smoking cessation. So great question, great question. Uh, and I think that's something that we can do. 
I'll end up by just encouraging you on a couple of uh, other quick things. Make sure you get some good ankle braces. Talking to military docs, like I said, these things are not very expensive. We should have these on the shelf. Again, we're looking for one that has a nice padded interior. It laces up like a high top tennis shoe and then has Velcro straps that goes over, that go over, uh, kind of make an X pattern, come up the sides as a lateral buttress. Getting those braces in the clinic for our patients so we can give them to them is going to help us because, you know, that decreases the amount of crutches that we have to give to people because they're going to be able to walk out of the exam room instead of having to use crutches. We still will need crutches sometimes. So getting those and having those around is really important for our patients. So make sure we have those. Make sure we code for those. Uh, you uh, can code for brace fitting. There's a CPT code you can use for that. But the most effective one is just to bump up your E&M code. An ankle sprain, if you're really doing everything we've talked about, if you're going to be printing out this handout, giving this person, walking them through the exercises, this is not a 99213. This is never going to be a 99213. You're going to be spending a lot more time with your patient than that. This is a 99214. Um, and if you have to do, you know, if you rule out a third degree ankle sprain, sending people off to x-ray and back, it might even be a 99215. It might, you might be spending 45 minutes with this person by the time you teach them how to use crutches, you put them in a brace, you make sure that they know their exercises, you make sure they've got everything set for their rehab, for their icing, and everything like that. These can be complicated. But remember, it's very, very worth it. It behooves us to do good work with this. Why? Let me just share one more data point with you. We know that people, Marines, young Marines who are in Marine basic training, if they have an ankle sprain, if they suffer an ankle sprain in basic training, 25% of those folks will not make it their whole time of enlistment. They will leave the military early with an early medical discharge. Why is that? It's probably because they're not getting good rehab up front. They're not really treating their, their ankle sprain properly. They don't all leave because of ankle pain, but they leave because of other things that happen to them uh, subsequent to that. It might be knee pain, it might be hip pain, it might be back pain, but they get other injuries. So an ankle sprain can really be a harbinger of bad things to come. So making sure we treat this up front with the very good triple therapy rehab, make sure that we get it braced to prevent secondary strain for at least six to eight months, certainly won't hurt you to wear those braces for the rest of your life with athletic endeavors, is not a bad thing at all. In fact, we can really do a great job of decreasing future musculoskeletal uh, morbidity in our patients and in the fighting force overall. Thank you all for being with us today on uh, our first Echo Sports Medicine broadcast. Like I said, this is our first in the series. We'll be back uh, every month at this uh, same same uh, date and time to have more things, and we look forward to you joining us then. If you have other questions, the slides are up. Uh, you can send me an email at my email address uh, that's listed on the slides, anthony.butler at usuhs.edu, and we'll happy to get back to you. Thanks very much, and have a nice day.